welcome everybody here this evening. And again, please uh, take your seats. Um, I'm Bill Carney. I am uh, president of Sustainable San Rafael. And with a friendly board member controlling the lights. Um, and with me is Belle Cole, who's the lead of organizing for Action Marin. Uh, we, we are uh, co-chairs of Time to Lead on Climate, which is a coalition of groups creating major events on climate change. And we do this at a time when the warming of the planet is speeding up and rapid action by everyone is critical. We want to acknowledge our key partners in the coalition, and you'll recognize probably most of these organizations' names. 350 Marin, Marin Conservation League, the Sierra Club Marin Group, Citizens Climate Lobby, Sustainable Marin, Cool the Earth, Resilient Neighborhoods, Marin School of Environmental Leadership, Environmental Forum of Marin, and a very special relevance tonight, Shore Up Marin. We also want to thank the 24 other supporting organizations that have joined us uh, to make this evening possible. All of our groups are listed in your program. Um, please talk with us this evening at the tables, uh, pick up information, and consider getting involved with one or more uh, of these groups to help bring climate action to the forefront in Marin and beyond. So our topic tonight is sea level rise, and our moderator, Marin Supervisor Kate Sears, has been at the forefront of that issue for a number of years. Uh, she's led the efforts to protect Richardson Bay from encroaching tides. She's now working with the Marin Bay Wave Project to expand those uh, efforts countywide. Uh, and she represents Marin on the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Uh, that has led Marin, the Bay Area, the whole Bay Area, to begin to grapple with sea level rise. We are, of course, in the middle of an election season. And uh, on the ballot, uh, June 7th, is Measure AA, a proposal to begin funding efforts to deal with sea level rise in San Francisco Bay. We'll hear uh, some about that measure tonight, and you'll be able to ask our speakers about it. Time to Lead on Climate is not an endorsing organization. Uh, we banded together to create this event to provide information about the impact of sea level rise uh, on Marin and on the Bay Area, and importantly, what we can do about it. Measure AA could be a first step uh, in that direction. We're honored to be joined by many Marin elected officials and candidates, and uh, Bell will now introduce them. small good evening <laughs> um, yes we want to thank uh, all our officials and candidates for being here and for caring about climate change and please stand when your name is read so elected officials Novato mayor Pat Eglin there she is she's here yay um, we have um, Tiburon town councilwoman um, Alice Fredericks, are you here? Okay. Uh, Las Galinas Valley Sanitary District Director, Megan Clark. There she is. Ross Valley Sanitary District Director, Pam Meggs. And uh, then we have uh, supervisory candidates. Uh, Susan Kirsch, there she is. <laughs> Wendy Kalen, Kalins, uh, Frank Egger, um, Kevin Haroff, and Marie, Mar Marie Mary Tamborot. And uh, I didn't mention that we have here, as elected officials, we have our moderator, Kate Sears, and we have Nancy Johnson, 
who is one of our speakers. So we are glad you're all here, and thanks for coming. And now our moderator, Kate Sears. Well, good evening, everyone. It's really wonderful to see so many people here tonight who are concerned about sea level rise, sea level rise and its impact here in Marin and in the Bay Area. And I'm curious, how many of you in the audience are from Marin County? Oh, we got a sweep. Is there, <laughs> is there anyone here from outside of Marin County, elsewhere in the East Bay? Thank you. And I, and I am curious, how many of you wish that you'd carpooled so parking was easier? <laughs> All right. So, um, as we all know, this past Friday was Earth Day, and the United Nations celebrated Earth Day by having 170 world leaders sign the climate agreement that was negotiated last December at the Climate Summit in Paris. We've been doing a number of great events related to climate change issues recently here in Marin, and I'm curious, another question for the audience, how many of you were among the 800 people that attended the Time to Lead on Climate Coalition's event last November at Dominican University to get ready for this historic UN summit. So a lot of people in the audience, that's great. <clears throat> we heard at that time about what is being done to begin seriously to address climate change globally by the UN, by the United States, and by our own state of California that really has been a wonderful leader in getting nations and jurisdictions of all sizes to work together around the globe to address climate change. That summit uh, at, at Dominican was tremendously informative and, inf and inspiring. And this fall, our great coalition of Marin groups uh, is planning to hear again from Congressman Huffman and other national leaders about how to make climate change a defining issue in this year's uh, uh, presidential elections. But tonight, we're really going to bring the issue of climate change home to the Bay Area and to Marin County as we consider the huge challenge of climate change in the form of sea level rise and how we can best confront that challenge. To frame our discussion, we have four speakers tonight who will address sea level rise in San Francisco Bay from different perspectives, from the perspectives of science, economics, social equity, and the environment. We're going to hear from each speaker for 15 minutes each, and then we'll spend the rest of the evening in conversation with the panel of our speakers responding to your questions about sea level rise and about how to approach it. So please be thinking of what you want to ask. Our ushers will be in the aisles at the end of each of our speakers' presentations, so just raise your hand and each usher will give you a card to write your questions on. They'll collect the cards, we'll sort them and bundle them to make sure the panel gets to address as many of your questions as possible. To facilitate that, I would urge you to keep your questions short if you can, and in question format. So, <clears throat> so you know what's in store for what we're coming up, uh, what's ahead of us with our four speakers. I'm going to introduce each of the four speakers to you right now, so you have information about them. Our first speaker is Dr. Stephen Crooks, who is a coastal scientist. He's been a delegate to the United Nations Climate Negotiations and for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He's a lead author of an IPCC report on greenhouse gas accounting for wetlands. He is a geomorphologist with more than 20 years of experience in coastal wetlands and their response to human impacts and climate change. He works with Environmental Science Associates, or ESA. Our next speaker is Adrian Covert, who is policy director for the Bay Area Council, providing research and advocacy leadership for the Council's committees on water, commuter shuttles, and 21st century communications infrastructure. Prior to joining the council, Adrian served on the research and communications team for Repair California, Californians for a State Constitutional Convention, and received a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from San Francisco State University. Our third speaker is Nancy Johnson, who is chair of both the Marin City Community Services District and Marin Grassroots. Nancy attended Jackson State University and received a real estate designation issued by the National Association of Real Estate. Nancy worked in social services and in low-income housing for over 20 years in Marin County. She currently serves on the board of the Marin City Health and Wellness Clinic and also on the Marin County Human Rights Commission. And our fourth speaker is David Lewis, 
For 18 years, David Lewis has, has led Save the Bay, the Bay's largest regional organization working to make the Bay cleaner and healthier for people and wildlife. David has led campaigns to win legal protections for the Bay, accelerate thousands of acres of wetland restoration, and prevent filling of the Bay. A Bay Area native, David previously worked in the U.S. Senate and on international nuclear arms control issues in Washington, D.C., and I can't think of a better background to be fighting climate change than nuclear arms negotiations. So now that you know what's ahead of you in terms of our four speakers, I really want to get the evening going tonight. We have a special video welcome from our climate champion in Washington, our Congressman Jared Huffman. He wanted to be here tonight, but had a conflict, so he's going to be with us virtually. I hope. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Congressman Jared Huffman here. I really wish I could be there with you for this important forum, but we haven't yet perfected the uh, technology to clone individuals and let them be in two places physically at once. We have, however, figured out a way for me to at least be in two places for this event, if you'll allow me to join you by way of this video message. Um, thank you for taking the time to discuss such an important topic, saving our bay from climate change, and also for continuously shining a light on important issues facing San Francisco Bay. And I want to especially welcome this all-star cast that you've assembled for tonight's forum. Thanks for all that you do. You know, as Californians, we are so fortunate to live near some of the most beautiful waters you'll find anywhere on the planet. San Francisco Bay and its Delta Estuary certainly qualify as that. They're also home to important fish and wildlife species, and these resources support many important industries in our coastal economy. So the work that you're doing to protect our coast, the Bay Delta ecosystem, and the entire watershed all the way up to the Sierras is really vital in that bigger picture of ensuring that generations of Californians can continue to live in a healthy environment and a thriving economy. Now, as you all know, climate change is going to present all kinds of problems for us. It will bring extreme weather events, sea level rise. It will threaten waters and place our communities at risk in, in many different ways if we don't act quickly and boldly. Climate change, I believe, is the single biggest issue facing this generation and the next. It could forever change our environment and our economy, and so I believe we have an economic and a moral imperative to act. There's just no doubt about it. We're in for a tough fight. It'll be tough politically and tough economically. I want you to know that you can count on me to work with dogged passion to get my colleagues in Congress to get off the sidelines and get into the role of leading on climate change with every tool that we can. I've tried to begin that process by introducing bills like the West Coast Ocean Protection Act and my Keep It in the Ground Act. I believe we're in this together, and I know that your advocacy makes a difference. So thank you for being champions. Thank you so much for all you do to protect our bay and our planet. I hope you have a great evening, and I look forward to seeing you soon. So this may be virtual appreciation for our congressman, but he really is our environmental hero in Washington and doing great work on our behalf. So now I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Stephen Crooks. Ah, good evening, everybody. Um, what a great turnout to see here this evening. Um, I think we're going to dim the lights on me so we can see the screen. And uh, luckily, I have a face for radio, so this will help. And um, a part of my job really today is to set some of the scene on the background of the science. You know, what is sea level rise? What causes it? And then how do we start to think about it in Marin? And now that we're through the Paris negotiations, which really was our last attempt really to try and pull together a global negotiation, um, it's now falling to, to nations and to local communities to now enact adaptation strategies and mitigation strategies to deal with, with climate change moving forward. And it's so great to see this kind of turnout in, in Marin to talk about this. So I'm going to give a bit of a background. Um, I'm a geologist, so I'm going to talk, start at the big scale, and then we'll start to narrow down in terms of what it means for Marin. 
Well, how much does sea level change around the coast of California? This is a, a, an image I've stolen from the USGS, and it shows a nice graphic of just, here's the, the coastline of what we know now is the shores of Moraine up here, and there's the bay. But 18,000 years ago, sea level was much lower. There's the Farallons. The sea went all the way to the edge of the continental shelf, was around about 140 feet below now, and it's gradually moved up to around about 8,000 years ago, started to come into the bay, and then filled up the bay over the last 8,000 years. And as part of this time, wetlands started to, to build up, the wetlands that we have today, the wetlands that we changed into coastal lowlands, which many of us now live in. Now, how much does sea level change? Well, this is a sea level change curve for the last uh, four million years. This is four million years over here. We like to think in long times. This is the present day over here. Now, each of these ups and downs represents a change in sea level. From here to here is about 100, 120 meters, 100, about 400 feet. And that's how much sea level changes through time. The, the, the curves are derived, this is a long-term trend, derived from ocean sediments. Uh, phytoplankton in the ocean uh, absorb um, um, part of gases from the atmosphere, and that keeps a track of what's, what's going on in the atmosphere, which we can relate to the extent of glaciers. And then that settles down and it falls into seabeds. So we actually have a long-term trend record which we can calibrate against what we see on land. So we have pretty good confidence that this actually represents what has happened in the past. Now, there are a few things you might notice in this trend. One, this is sea level now. Sea level has been higher in the past, in the recent past. That's 125,000 years ago, that's 400,000 years ago. But way back when, sea level was just generally higher than it is now all of the time. What's happened is that as the glaciers extended in Iceland and Antarctica and Greenland, progressively sea level dropped. What also coincides with this, and I'll come back to this, is that CO2 in the atmosphere also dropped as well. And we see an increased sensitivity to how glaciers respond. And I'll, I'll come back to this. But the takeaway message is sea level is always changing. We're right now what generally would be near the top of, uh, of sea level, but there's actually potential with more ice melts to go back up again to what we used to have a long time ago. Why does this happen? Well, the natural causes relate to how the, the Earth wobbles around, either wobbles in terms of its oscillation around the, plant, around the sun, or how it oscillates and wobbles just on its own axis. And this is driven by gravitational interactions with the sun, with the moon, but also other big planets like Jupiter that every now and again pull the Earth in a bit of an ellipse. And that affects the amount of uh, heat that is directed, particularly along the poles, which is where, uh, where the uh, glaciers are. And so you get these predictable cycles of different time periods, around about 100 to 400,000 years for these ellipses here, to 41,000 years, to, to around about 20,000 years. And these constructively interfere to give a pattern of heat uh, impacting on the Earth, which then influence the glaciers, the big glacier in Antarctica, and the smaller glacier in uh, Greenland, which holds enough water to cause around about five meters of sea level rise on its own, it affects the, the, the size of ice sheets. And then on the smaller scale, every now and again, you get a volcano erupt or other factors like that, which cause a cooling effect. And so there are these long-term trends going on, and also natural trends like volcanoes, which can have the opposite effect. So these drive our big climate changes. And then we came along. And one of the things we did is we, we took CO2 that was trapped within rocks in the form of oil, and we started putting it back into the atmosphere again. So the other parameter that's important, is, as well as the amount of sun that is getting onto the polar areas, and the amount of heat in that regard, is the, the heat trapping capabilities of the atmosphere. And though uh, gases like CO2 represent a very small part of the atmosphere, they have a very strong warming effect. So as we increase the amount of CO2, but also methane, nitrous oxide, and other gases, then we start to increase the warming globally all the way around the planet, which also leads to melting of ice and expansion of seawater. So in this particular curve, what we see here, this is a graph from the latest IPCC report. Um, this is the amount of, of, of warming which has been seen since 1951 to, through to 2010. And then they've looked at different causes, estimates from greenhouse gases, other anthropogenic forcing factors. Uh, we put more dust into the atmosphere, which causes a cooling effect. Um, Combined together, it pretty much represents the, the amount of warming that we're seeing. And here's the natural forcing factors associated with the, the wobble of the planet. Um, 
and volcanoes, not a big effect over that time period. The warming that we have seen is driven by the anthropogenic factors, the release of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So while there's this long-term trend that's taking place, we're having a warming effect on top of that. Now, thinking about this from the very long term, what can we, how can we try and pull these different pieces of information together? Well, this is a graphic which tells us here we are um, in the current day, we compare what was past warm climates like and how were those environments and what does that inform us about what our possible future might be? This graph here represents the, the elevations, represents sea level. Here's the elevation on this side compared to today. And then we have measures of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is collected directly or from ice cores in the case of historic events. And we also have estimates of what the temperature was back then and these different time intervals from pollen analysis and other measures that you can find within sediments. So in the present day, here, oh yes, sorry, is this, am I wandering around too much? There we go. So in the present day, this is where we are right here. And what we've done is we've, um, well actually I'll start with this one. This is the sea level 125,000 years ago during the last big interglacial. CO2 was around about the same CO2 level as we have right now. But sea, uh, but sea level elevations were higher than we have now by around about six to nine meters. So there's still quite a lot of potential um, rise in sea level we could have for the same temperature and the same amount of CO2 as we have right now. And that reflected the gradual uh, melting the Greenland, Greenland ice sheet in particular. So this is a long-term process that takes place. Now, 400,000 years ago is an interesting one because right now we're predicted to have a warm interval that lasts around about 40,000 years. So we have a lot of warm period left before it gets cold for us here again. And that was the last time we had a nice, really long warm interval was 400,000 years ago. Again, CO2 was about the same as it is now. We hadn't taken oil and stuck it in the atmosphere. But sea level was even higher then, maybe 6 to 13 meters. So again, there's still considerable capacity for more sea level rise as we move forward. And then way back, three million years ago, when we had more CO2 in the atmosphere, temperatures were higher, and sea level was way higher than it is now. You know, well over six meters, maybe 30 meters than it, above what it is presently. So there is considerable potential for a lot more sea level rise. So the challenge for us is, can we, uh, how fast is sea level going to rise? Can we manage our CO2 so that we don't trip a rapid change in the environment that we can't deal with. So, this is why the countries came together at the Paris negotiations. Now, there are a number of different things that, that were very important coming out of this meeting. One, 195 countries agreed to act on climate change. It was left very flexible. It's down to the national capabilities to come up with a strategy. Um, but as on last week, 175 countries have signed up with their strategies for how to move forward. The goal is that a whole temperature below 2 degrees C. Now that's seen as kind of a critical threshold. It's not clear whether that will be enough, but it's seen as being potentially achievable. But really the goal, the ambitious target of 1.5 degrees C was set. Now if you've been following any of this, you know that each country put forward their contribution to how they're going to try and reduce greenhouse gases. We're still at 3 degrees C based upon that alone. So we still have to reduce greenhouse gases a lot more than we've actually committed to. No matter what we do, sea level will continue to rise to some extent. The question is how fast and how far will it go? Uh, various elements of the negotiations that were put forward relate to how we're going to finance and help with the development of um, developing countries and help them deal with climate change and also help them reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions, which then benefits us also. Another part of it also is that you know, while transport and energy and um, industry are the big emitters, we really need to think about how we do uh, manage our landscapes as well and how we use those to reduce greenhouse gases. And each country put forward their commitment. Now, coming to Marin, you know, this is near my, my house. This is Manzanita Car Park. There is Highway 1 under there. Here we are. This is Seminary Drive going onto the freeway. You know, already we have flooding issues. It's only nuisance level flooding right now. But we're going to have to learn to deal with more and more flooding in our coastal areas. One of the things we're also trying to do now is that California is actually taking a very strong lead on trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As part of that, we want to work in cities and we want to work with transport to try and reduce those emissions and reduce our greenhouse gas footprint. 
Now, we're going to have to think very carefully about how we do that, because one of our challenges, the easier places to do it, might be the same locations where you're going to have flood risk in the future. So we want to not get ourselves into trouble by building more infrastructure where we might want to move infrastructure out when we get sea level rise. So that's a planning challenge we have yet to, to really address. What has also changed is how we think about how we manage water and how we deal with issues like sea level rise, but also the things that are going to change like rainfall patterns and hydrology. The old way of thinking about managing hydrology, um, you know, the Corps of Engineers would come in, they'd dig a nice big trapezoidal channel, and they would try and move water through the landscape as fast as possible. If it's raining, get it out to sea. But, you know, those processes had trouble. The channels would fill in with sediment, then you'd get more flooding issues. So the, now that the way that we think about managing water is to try and absorb it within the landscape. We try and spread it out. Move back levees so that water is spread out so you don't get so much in the way of flooding. Create space at the bottom so that the water can get out so it reduces flooding upstream. At the same time, you can help with water infiltration into aquifers. You can sequester carbon. You can bring back natural systems and ecology within the landscape. At the same time as we do this, we're going to have to think about also how, with sea level rise, we gradually phase back and retreat to some degree, move infrastructure out. We have to take this kind of landscape approach, but if you integrate nature with physical hard infrastructure, these kind of things can be very um, simpatical. An example of that, this is a study that um, environmental science associates were involved with the Bay Institute, who we've worked with a, an awful long time. Looking at the cost, for instance, of if you around, live around the bay and you have a levee, how does that compare against the cost of having a wetland in front of that levee? Does it reduce the cost at all? Well, it does. And now what, what happens is that when you have deeper water, you have more wave activity, you have surges affecting against the levee, you need a much larger structure to resist flooding and erosion. But if you put a wetland in front of it, it helps to damp down the waves and it can absorb that, so you need a much smaller structure. Here's the cost differential here. So around about this is in millions of dollars per mile. You know, for just this kind of levy, it might be something of the order of $12 million per mile. But bringing in a wetland, it can drop it down to six. So wetlands are an important part of an adaptation strategy that help reduce costs, as well as bring back environmental improvements. We've incorporated some of this thinking. This is the Hamilton Wetlands Restoration Project. Some of you may, may live next to it. I've been involved in this um, for over 10 years. Um, that, sorry, the Hamilton Wetlands Restoration Project here. This is what the site's going to look like. This is what it, it, looks like, it looked like until recently in an uh, air base with a runway. And we've started, you know, we've actually now reconnected it, used 7 million cubic yards of dredge material to rebuild wetlands, but included wide uh, natural living levees along the edges as well to provide a measure of flood protection and bring back environmental conditions at the same time. These kind of things are very important in how we think about moving forward. In the same sort of setting in the Napa River, the living river concept was developed here in, in Napa, eventually adopted by the Corps of Engineers naturally, nationally, which provides an opportunity to open up the floodplain, recover ecology, increase carbon sequ sequestration, and improve flood management. These kind of approaches can be developed and adopted all around the Bay. So what are the takeaway messages? Um, sea level rise will continue to take place. Uh, we've yet to see how fast and how far. Reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is necessary to limit the extent of sea level rise. That's the most important thing we can be doing. But we shouldn't just focus on that, we should also focus on how we manage the landscapes. Greening urban and natural and working lands contributes to reducing greenhouse gases and it has an environmental benefit as well. Minimizing future development in coastal lowlands will create the space for us to adapt to climate change. Space is probably one of our biggest challenges, and that's what we need to work with. Can we prevent more development in vulnerable locations? Combining natural and hard infrastructure offers solutions to maintain environmental quality. It can reduce the cost of flood protection and has environmental benefits. And also, perhaps the last point, Action is really required now, because when you think about infrastructure, you're thinking 25 to 50 years out. We need to be starting to do the planning to get these things lined up so that we're ready for when climate change increases in pace. And with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.
Good evening. Can we uh, dim the lights here? Yep. Thank you. My name is Adrian Covert. I'm the policy director for the Bay Area Council. Uh, thank you, Bill, for having me, and thank you for uh, Sustainable San Rafael for having this great event. It's very timely. As was mentioned earlier, there's a couple really important things on the ballot in just a couple weeks that's really going to have an opportunity for all of us to actually play a direct impact on solving some of the problems that you're going to hear about uh, in the next few moments and that we just heard about from Stephen. First thing I want to mention is a couple key points that you're going to get from my presentation. One is that the Bay Area is one of the most robust coastal economies in the world. Two is that we're currently at risk for about $10 billion in damage from an extreme storm event even without sea level rise. This is the status quo right now. But third, with a little bit of investment, the Bay Area could position itself as the most climate resilient coastal region in the world. And so that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the Bay Area Council, which I represent. The Bay Area Council is a business-backed, nonprofit public policy advocacy organization uh, founded in 1945. It's a multi-sector group, um, meaning it represents tech companies and finance and uh, the major trade sectors of the economy, the ports of Oakland and San Francisco, the sports teams, uh, basically the largest employers in the Bay Area, uh, Bank of America, Safeway, the major employers. And we focus on a couple key, uh, couple key public policy areas, housing, transportation, water, workforce development, and 21st century energy and communications infrastructure. And I can tell you on each one of these policy areas, climate change plays a major role in how we tackle it. Most obviously on water policy and the drought. We just did a poll that's going to be released um, in the next uh, couple days that found that Bay Area resident attitudes on the severity and the importance of the drought has plummeted over the past couple months because of a couple storms. For the record, El Nino was not that powerful, and our water infrastructure is far from being recovered from our historic five-year drought, which at some estimates is the worst that California has experienced in 1,200 years. So water infrastructure is still something very top of mind. Um, but next, let's talk about extreme weather events, and can anyone recall what happened, what was happening October 2012? Sandy, very good, very smart crowd. Hurricane Sandy was happening. And Hurricane Sandy happened only a couple years after Hurricane Katrina. And then, of course, the major hurricane in the Philippines. And so what we're seeing is, uh, when that ha was happening in October 2012, the Bay Area Council Executive Committee, the main governing board of the Bay Area Council, was having their board meeting at the board offices of Kaiser Permanente in Oakland. Beautiful facility, great view of the Bay. And we're watching on TV the disaster and the crisis, the humanitarian crisis that resulted in over 100 people dying in New York and New Jersey, billions of dollars of economic damage. And someone mentioned that out our window, there's an awful lot of water in that bay. And an awful lot of stuff developed right along it. What would happen? And what is the vulnerability of the Bay Area to an extreme storm event? So we asked the question, how vulnerable are we to an extreme storm? So next, uh, we did some looking. First, let's take a look at California's average annual precipitation and take note that average annual precipitation is a statistical construct in California. The line represents the average, but very few years actually hit average. This year was actually one year that came reasonably close to hitting the average precipitation. Normally it's far above or it's far below. One good thing though that's lucky about California is that we don't have hurricanes. That's the good news. The bad news is we have atmospheric rivers. Atmospheric rivers this is a satellite imagery photo where you can see west, coast, west coasts throughout the world are vulnerable to this type of storm event where you have ribbons of moisture stretching from the equator 
moving towards the poles in either direction until they run into a landmass. In this instance right here, California, you can't see it too well, but that's an atmospheric river hitting California. And we haven't, and, and you know, we rely on these systems to provide most of our precipitation, so in general, they're good things. However, they can be enormous. And we've had recent examples uh, in the recent past of extreme storm events in the Bay Area that didn't get much news. So, well, you can't really see that very well at all, can you? Well, I'll tell you what it is. This is a map of the Bay Area, and with San Francisco about here, and then that's the South Bay, and then the North Bay, we're right up here. And each one of these red dots represents a storm that came in through the Bay Area, and at that location, developed a precipitation level of a 1,000 year return period, meaning that you're not gonna see precipitation like that in average in over 1,000 years. So an extreme storm event. Luckily, these have been isolated in lowly populated areas as part of a larger storm system and not much damage was caused. However, we have experiences in our recent past, recent in you know, recorded California history past, of something much, much larger hitting the Bay Area. And so does anyone recall the, the, the biggest storm event in the history of modern California? You guys are brilliant. 1862. 1862. It happened in Sacramento. It was the Great Flood of 1862. It began in December. It ended in January. It's 40 days. Biblical. One of those ribbons that I showed you, the Atmospheric River, it hit California with the volumetric equivalent of 16 Mississippi rivers. That's how much precipitation was in this thing. And when it hit California, it destroyed Sacramento, and it turned the Central Valley into an inland sea 300 miles long and 30 miles wide. We get storms like these about every 150 years. And how long has it been? <laughs> it's been a while. So. We asked ourselves, what would happen today if something like this happened in the Bay Area? And it's important to consider this because the Bay, this California depends on the Bay Area economy. The California, econ California depends on the Bay Area economy to the tune of with the fact that we have only 17% of the state's population, and yet we produce 35% of the state's income tax. Great deal for the rest of the state. So how much are we at risk? This map is a, risk, is a map of the Bay Area 100-year floodplain. So if we got a one, uh, the once in a hundred, the, the century storm, these are the areas that could be expected to flood. Some of these areas have flood protection in place. So you're not gonna see all of that flood, but a lot of them don't, and a lot of it is put together unevenly. So the next question is, how much and what is inside that floodplain? About 355,000 residents and about $46 billion in structures and contents. Now, that's kind of abstract. So what does that really mean for communities, for our economy, for businesses? That means 35 schools, 15 healthcare facilities, six fire departments, five police departments, 800 miles of roads and highways, 68 miles of rail, 46 wastewater treatment plants combined for an 800 million gallons of sewage processing daily, three electric power plants. That's the infrastructure that's in harm's way. And trade, just to give you another idea of what kind of economic activity occurs on the Bay, about annually $4 billion in trade, producing 44,000 jobs, occur between the ports of San Francisco, Oakland, Richmond, and Redwood City. Our fishing industry accounts for about 40 to 50 million dollars a year. And tourism just in San Francisco alone, which has a lot to do with the Bay, produces 70,000 jobs. So I've mentioned these figures. I think these figures are important for people who say, look, 
I don't live near the bay. I live on a home. I, was, I live on a hill. I'm responsible. I don't live anywhere near the bay. Well, I got bad news. If you like to commute to work, flush your toilet, and turn your lights on, you depend on what's happening on the bay because all the infrastructure that makes our economy tick is located there. So next, the Bay Area Council Economic Institute, the think tank within the Bay Area Council, did a, a report called Surviving the Storm that analyzed what would happen if a major storm event hit the Bay Area economy. We partnered up with some of the best minds in the region from AECOM, the Brattle Group, Gensler, the Moore Foundation, the Coastal Conservancy, and the flood protection agencies. And what we modeled was a 150-year storm event, something smaller than the event that hit in 1862, but bigger than anything since. Uh, it would leave about 12 inches of rain over four to seven days. That's the peak rainfall over four to seven days. It would rain for about two weeks total, but you'd get that peak over four to seven days. Elevated creek and rivers and flows lasting over a week with peak floods for one day. A high t and this would be occurring at the same time as a king tide event, and I'll tell you why in a moment, why that's important. And the area would be inundated by floodwaters based on analysis of flood flows and a review of FEMA flood maps from other flood studies that we were able to pull into informing the study. This map here, so this is what the storm looks like. Our storm is the black line that peaks up here. And what this graph shows is right here at zero, that is peak flood, peak runoff from the storm at about right here. And then these are the number of days of the storm before peak and the number of days of the storm after peak. So what you see modeled against, these are all these other lines that you see here are historic storms data that we already have. And so we compared our storm to other storms and it's, it's extreme, but it's within the realm of the reasonable you can see the storm would build up slowly over the course of about five days, and it would peak here to amongst the strongest storms we've seen on record, last for a full day of peak runoff, and then it would drop down still with significant runoff for a total of about 10 days, and it peters off after that for about an almost two-week period. So next, It's important to realize that as this rain comes down, this rain will fill the bay, and the bay will start to rise like a bathtub. And that's important because what happened with Hurricane Sandy was that was a perfect storm event that occurred at the same time they had their peak high tides. Totally reasonable for us to assume that a storm event like this would occur during our peak high tides, our king tides, because our king tides occurred during the storm season, in December and in January. So this is what it would look like added on to a king tide event. This dot right here is, represents a storm at a high tide with one inches of rainfall. So you're looking at a high, maximum high tide of about six feet. So you get a king tide with an inch of rainfall. You get about 6.2, 6.3 feet of elevation in the bay. You add eight inches of rainfall, and suddenly you're almost at seven feet of surge elevated tide in the bay. And we modeled a bit higher than that, so it could be about an inch or a foot or so higher than this. Now, the damages. The event that we studied here would result approximately in this. Structural damages of about $6 billion. Content damages, this is the contents of the economic activity occurring in those structures, buildings around the bay, about $4 billion. Air transportation delay damages. This is from SFO being out of commission for a couple days. Road transportation delay damages. These are in the millions. Uh, this is delayed from economic activity not getting to your jobs. And electricity service interruption costs, 125 million from economic activity not occurring because buildings don't have power. This is how it breaks down by county, and we're in Marin County now, and you're looking at one of actually the third highest amount of damage in all the Bay Area countywide for about $1.2 billion in damages in, um, in Marin County. This is a really conservative estimate, I want to stress, because this does not include the cost of repairing highways or the airports. 
when the flood comes in, it will probably cause structural damage. That will cost millions, if not billions of damages. That's not included. This also doesn't include potential loss of life. Does not also include the potentially catastrophic events, uh, effects of a levee failure in the Sacramento Delta. What's important about this is that about half of the water in the South Bay is imported from the Sacramento Delta. And if a, this storm of this magnitude wouldn't stop in the Bay Area, it would proceed eastward and it could have an impact on the, the Bay Area, a significant portion of the Bay Area's water supply. So to wrap up, what we need to do is what Steve mentioned earlier in the last couple slides. He actually had this exact image. We need a mixture of green and gray infrastructure along the bay. Green infrastructure is going to be really important. Wetland restoration projects, tidal marshes to absorb tidal surges during storm events. They act like a sponge and they allow us to produce a lower cost solution, a lower cost levy behind it. It's a cost effective way of using nature to do it. Environmentalists have been trying to do this for birds and fish for a long time. The business community is now involved because the state of the art of flood protection infrastructure has come around to identify that this type of flood protection is cost effective and it gets the job done. Not in all places, you're not gonna put a wetland in front of the ferry building in San Francisco. So this is the beginning of the conversation. It won't solve everything, but it will solve a lot. And so these are the recommendations from the Bay Area Council's Economic Institute report, which you can find online. The main thing I'd like to highlight is funding. Everyone likes to talk about these other things, but money is the biggest problem. It always is. That's why Measure AA is so important, and our next speaker will be talking a lot more about it. Thank you. So good evening. I don't have a PowerPoint, so you're just going to have to look at me. <laughs> Is that better? Okay, good. So my name is Nancy Johnson and I wear many hats and as I was listening to the other speakers I was thinking which hat do I wear coming before you and uh, I thought well I could speak as chairperson of the Marin City Community Services District and Marin City being one of the most vulnerable communities in the county but that's not enough because we have the canal area. And then I thought I could wear my Human Rights Commission's hat and try to appeal to your sense of brotherhood and decency and all that. And I thought that still may not be enough. So I think I'll just speak to you as Nancy Johnson, a resident, a native of Marin County, a person that loves where she lives and lives here by choice. My parents came to Marin County during the war and I settled in Marin City. My father was in the army, my mother worked for a short time in the shipyard. And I can remember um, living, you know, in the hills, the headlands of Marin City and looking out over the bay and just expecting that it was always going to be the same. But now that I'm older, I have to think about not only my children, but my grandchildren. And I have grandchildren that, well, I have at least one grandson that, that lives here in the county and of course, like any other parent or grandparent, I'm concerned with his future. And I know that if we don't act now, he may not have a future here in Marin County, and that is heartbreaking for me. I love it here because we are a community. We come into rooms like this, and, and we know lots of people in this room and our children go to schools together. They share places of entertainment. My grandson loves to go to San Rafael and play miniature golf out at McInnes Park. When I think of what could happen in the event of sea level rise to Marin City and 
and the canal district. Again, it's heartbreaking. And I think it's, it's, not, just, it's not just the vulnerable residents of Marin City and the canal area. It's, it's anyone that lives in Marin County. When you think about San Rafael and the canal area, you have to go past that. You have to go towards Peacock Gap and think about the people that live there. If the people in the canal area are locked in, can't get out because of flood waters, guess what? The people that live further out can't either. If Marin City is locked in, if the highway floods, if the water rises and floods Marin City, the people at the top of the hill that live in the headlands, they can't, they can't get out either. You know, to, to consider being unable to either leave your community to go see about people that you might be concerned with that might be in danger. When you think about, you may live in maybe even Nevada, but if you have a, res a relative, a friend, or even you know someone that has a relative or a friend that maybe lives in the, in the Redwood Senior Complex, they can't get out. You know, I think it's, it's really important that we consider a strategic plan. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that there are people who have um, much more information than I do, but, you know, are considering a plan um, because for, for Marin City, if we can't be, if we can't leave, then that means nobody can get in. We have elders in Marin City who need medical attention. We have, well, I've told this story before, so let me just tell you this. Uh, this one of the speakers before me spoke about um, the years that there were floods, but didn't mention the storm of 2007. In 2007, in December, well, I guess it was 2006, December, we had a storm. The water rose. We didn't call it sea level rise. We called it flooding. The lights went out. Uh, people didn't have transportation. And my daughter was nine months pregnant. In fact, she was overdue. When the sky turned dark, and I could see that, you know, we were going to be in trouble in the case that she may go into labor. Women's intuition told me, get out and get out now. So I left. I had to leave here, and I thought, I have to get to higher ground. And at first I thought, well, I'll go to Embassy Suites or maybe the Sheraton. Thankfully, a friend of mine offered me shelter in their home, but I'm going to tell you my daughter went into labor that very night. If I had remained in Marin City, the grandson that I spoke to you about may not be here because I would have had to deliver him. Uh, you know, so thank God <laughs> you know, for women's intuition. But I just want to say, it. you know, um, I thought about what are we going to do? And I think the first thing that we have to do is we have to think about the man in the mirror. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. Michael Jackson made um, a recording called The Man in the Mirror. And it, was, it talked about when you want to see change and you want to make change, the first thing you need to do is you need to look in the mirror and you need to make a decision about what it is that you are going to do to be a part of the change. I, um, you know, I just want us to think about who we are. You know, we are 
family members. We, some of us are head of households. Some of us are the elders in our family. Some of us are the caregivers in our families. But it's not just our immediate families. It's the person that lives next door. My neighbor next door is 93, 94 years old. When I think about if our, because I live in a, a townhouse, and I, I think about if there's a disaster, even if there's a fire, you know, what am I going to do? And one of the things that I know that I'm going to do, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to call my grandson and tell him, come on, let's go. But the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that Mr. Ray Manaster has some service that he's able to get out. And I think that, you know, as a member of this, not only just Marin County, not just of where we live, but a member of our being. We are all human beings and we were created to take care of each other. And I just ask you that we all do that. Take a look in the mirror. Start, start with yourself. Thank you. Good evening, I'm David Lewis. I'm the Executive Director of Save the Bay and thank you very much for including me tonight uh, with such an august group of speakers and so much knowledge in the room. And uh, I'm pleased and not surprised to see such a large turnout uh, of people who want to be active in their community and want to be knowledgeable about this issue uh, because that's very much in the Bay Area tradition uh, that I'm gonna start by speaking about uh, because I think that in our recent history, we've accomplished some amazing things to make our region what it is today, and that should give us encouragement that uh, we can do exactly what we were just encouraged to do, which is take action locally uh, on a problem that may seem daunting because it is so global. So maybe when we get the lights down, you can see. When I was born here in the Bay Area in 1961, this was a pretty common sight in the Bay. This is actually in Sausalito in 1961. The Bay was on the verge of death. Uh, the Bay was a place where we put our garbage and where we put our garbage dumps. And the Bay was a shallow, area that was very susceptible to filling and uh, expanding our cities. And the bay was where we put our sewage. The sign says, don't swim. This is contaminated. It's Chrissy Field Beach. I was there today. It's gorgeous and clean, but uh, at the time it was choked with sewage. And so much filling of the bay had taken place that there was a real risk of the bay being narrowed to the width of the river. This is a cartoon version in the Oakland Tribune, but it reflected an actual report that had been done by the U.S. Department of Commerce that showed that the bay was already a third smaller by 1960, and 60% of what was left was shallow enough to be filled and should be filled and would be filled by 2020. So images like this actually galvanized people to action. And right here in Marin, Richardson Bay was at risk of being completely filled in as well. And it started a citizen movement. <laughs> Apparently, I don't need to tell you who these three ladies are. <laughs> Maybe some of you have been active at different times in your life in the Save the Bay movement or in a local group that was working to save the Bay. Uh, these were three women who were living in the Berkeley Hills. They could see the bay being filled in, and they thought the bay was beautiful and should be saved, and so they started an organization to do that. They started a grassroots movement that was so successful in such a short period of time that it actually inspired other movements around the Bay Area to save redwoods, to save the Marin Headlands, to save open space and expand parks, and it's the reason that we have the beautiful places that we have today to live. 
And the way they did it was uh, actually not primarily through scientific studies. None of them were botanists or birders or chemists. Uh, but they created images and they created simple explanations for people about what was happening. This is San Francisco Bay Phil Company, Instant Land, our specialty. And this was a editorial cartoon in the San Francisco Chronicle. They mobilized people like Don Sherwood, very popular radio disc jockey. And they got the word out that way uh, in ways that people could understand. And they got the base saved. In just four years, they actually got a moratorium declared on filling in the bay. And in 1969, this permanent agency, the first ever to protect a coastal zone, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, which Supervisor Sears still serves on. And I, I show this picture because that, that is Ronald Reagan. Uh, the measure to make this agency permanent and to save the Bay passed the legislature by one vote and was signed into law by Ronald Reagan, and it was bipartisan. Right? At the time, it was Republicans and Democrats who were supporting this. So if we back up to the image you've seen earlier of a satellite view from space, you can see how much we've altered the Bay. We've filled in most of the marshes and the shallow edges of the Bay and built on them. And now the base is facing new threats, including climate change and pollution. And those are actually linked, because the pollution the Bay is experiencing now comes from land. It doesn't come from factories and refineries and sewage treatment plants. For the most part, those are regulated. It comes from what washes off our streets and into the Bay. And as precipitation patterns change, as you've heard earlier, we're going to get different kinds of pollution pulses into the Bay. Well, we have a really unusual opportunity to act locally and do something this June uh, on the June 7th ballot that can actually start to contribute to some of the solutions that you've already heard about. We've actually known for about 20 years uh, that the Bay needs more tidal marshes and we have places where those marshes can be restored. And we also know that the Bay is very popular and we love it as people who live here and we want it to be cleaner and healthier. And so the missing ingredient is actually money. And the urgency to do this faster than we were planning to, to restore the bay faster, is actually coming from the threat of climate change. So on the June 7th ballot uh, will be Measure AA. And this is a measure that's on the ballot in all nine counties. It's a tiny tax of $12 per parcel in all nine counties, all taxable parcels. And by contributing these small amounts, over 20 years it will raise half a billion dollars for Bay Marsh restoration projects that are located throughout the region. And an agency that's been set up only for this purpose, that has no other powers and no other bureaucracy and no other staff, just to propose a tax measure to the people and to spend the money in grants for tidal marsh restoration projects uh, that have multiple benefits around the bay. So here is an image showing that, uh, oops, in around 1800 we had, before major European settlement here, we had about 200,000 acres of tidal marsh. And because of all this activity to fill in dike areas, we were down to about 40,000 acres by 1998. But we have places around the bay that have not been paved over that can be restored to tidal marsh and get us back to 100,000 acres that the scientists tell us are necessary for the bay to be healthy. And here's a bar graph that shows that we have about 44,000 acres of tidal marsh today. And look at this light green bar. This property is already bought and acquired for the purpose of being restored. These are salt ponds in the South Bay and hay fields in the North Bay along Highway 37 and other areas around the bay, we can get to nearly double the tidal marsh and a lot closer to this 100,000 acres if we just have the money to restore this property that's already been bought for that purpose. Tidal marshes provide so many benefits. You've heard about many of them already. Uh, and this is uh, just laying that all out on one slide. But let me show you some of the Endangered species that only live in San Francisco Bay tidal marsh. This is the Ridgeways rail on the left and the salt marsh harvest mouse on the right. But the part you can't see is the biological diversity in these tidal marshes really forms the base of the food chain 
that everything else that lives in the bay depends upon. And you've also seen this image that tidal marshes can help provide more protection in combination with levees to protect communities and vital infrastructure all around the bay. So the agency that is putting this measure AA on the ballot is the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority. You know, because we have nine counties and 100 cities and many, many agencies in the Bay, it actually sometimes gets in the way of taking action as a region. So this is a regional special district, and it has no power or purpose other than to propose what it's now doing with Measure AA, to propose to voters new public funding mechanisms that are for tidal marsh restoration. Uh, it's governed by a board of seven elected officials from the Round of Bay Area, and it has an advisory board of 50 very diverse community interests representing it. If this measure passes, and it needs to pass by a two-thirds margin, because of our tax laws in this state, two-thirds of the combined votes, not two-thirds in each county, the money will be used for grants to support tidal marsh restoration projects, and those projects depending on the particular project, provides some or all of these benefits to fish and wildlife, water quality, shoreline protection, and beautiful places for us to access and enjoy. The projects, the potential projects, are all around the Bay Area. Some of the largest are in and near Marin County. Next to Hamilton Field, which you showed a picture of earlier, is the Belmarin Keys project. It's 1,000 acres that's already acquired to be restored to tidal marsh, but we don't have the money to do the restoration. And then several large projects up along Highway 37, uh, including Skaggs Island. But you can see there are potential projects all around the bay. An amazing broad coalition has come together to support this measure. Uh, and one of the reasons that this hasn't happened sooner is because it's taken many years to do the education of constituencies around the Bay Area. And uh, as Adrian mentioned, for the business community to appreciate the additional benefits of tidal marsh restoration beyond the immediate benefits for fish and wildlife. But you could see we have support from unions, from local governments, from business and environment, and many, many local groups. And I've just listed a few of the many endorsers of this uh, measure, highlighted a few from here in Marin County where there's very uh, strong support. And just today, uh, Governor Brown announced that he will support Measure AA as well and endorse that. It's unusual to have a measure uh, that's on the ballot in all nine counties. In fact, it's, it's barely ever happened and uh, so it's striking that newspapers from all around the Bay Area have also endorsed this, including uh, the Marin IJ just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, some of the things that the newspaper editorials have highlighted uh, that are unusual about this and additional reasons to vote for it is the fact that we would be taking action together as a region. You know, we have many problems as a Bay Area native. I'm really uh, attuned to all the things the Bay Area does well and some of the things we have not done well and some of our biggest problems in addition to this challenge of sea level rise, transportation, affordable housing, education, these are not problems that can be solved by one city or one county alone. Very few of us even live and work in the same city or county. Now, these are regional problems and if we're able to do this, if we're able to come together as a region and pass Measure AA, and start to take action to improve our bay and to protect some of our shoreline, uh, it gives us some, some muscle, some practice, uh, and some relationships that we didn't have before to be able to tackle some of those other really challenging problems. Um, we face a, an immediate problem with sea level rise and a long-term challenge. Um, what Measure AA will fund over the next 20 years uh, will not be all the work that we need to do. And it will be a lasting solution if we are also able to tackle uh, the mitigation of greenhouse gases and slow sea level rise. So we need to do both of those things. Uh, but what I really want to end with is that this actually is one of those situations where a big regional problem that's part of a big global challenge 
uh, affords us an opportunity to do something as individuals. We've never had a chance as a region to vote for San Francisco Bay, and we're about to get that chance. In fact, if you vote by mail, you're going to get a ballot around May 12th. So just three weeks left to get the word out about this. When we do our polling, this issue polls very well. It looks like we get two-thirds of the vote. But a lot of people won't know this is on the ballot unless we get the word out. Uh, just today, we were filming advertisements. We've uh, raised quite a bit of money to get the message out. But we can do even more as individuals. All of us have networks of people, neighbors, email lists, etc. So I encourage you to do several things. First of all, don't forget to vote for this measure, Measure AA, Measure AA. It's near the bottom of the ballot in all nine counties. Uh, if your registration's not up to date, you still have a few weeks to get that done. You've moved recently. And uh, please encourage all your friends and neighbors to vote for Measure AA. In the back of the room, on the right side, we have some folks here from the Measure AA campaign. They have more information. Uh, they will take your endorsement. If you would like to help as a volunteer, you can go to the website and sign up and volunteer to help us in the next few weeks get the word out. And the folks at the back table will help you as well. And if you'd like to make a donation to help make sure that more people see the beautiful campaign ads that we filmed at Chrissy Field and China Camp today, um, that's always appreciated as well. Uh, look forward to your questions, and thanks very much for your attention. So I really want to thank all of our speakers for their incredibly diverse viewpoints. There was a little bit of terror and a little bit of hope. And I think that gives us all a lot to, to move forward on the conversation. And so I'd like to invite the speakers to come back up. We're going to start our panel discussion. And while they're coming up, um, I'd like to mention that the Marin Coalition is hosting another discussion of Measure AA on May 4. You can visit their website for information about that program. Sustainable Marin will present a Sustainability Counts Candidates Forum for all 13 candidates for supervisor on May 12th here at the San Rafael Community Center. And so we're now going to spend really the rest of our evening expanding on the discussion and on our conversation by having our panel respond to your questions. I have a handful of questions already. Um, but please raise your hand if you, there is a question that you would like to ask and our ushers will come along and give you a card or collect your card. So I'm going to, as our panelists are getting themselves situated, I'm going to ask that you condense your answers to two minutes um, so that we can get as many questions in as we possibly can. And then if everybody's ready to go, here we go. All right, Dr. Stephen Crooks, my first question is for you. This is not Jeopardy. Um, how much impact can behaviors or personal choices make on eventual, eventual sea level rise? You showed how sea level rise has happened over hundreds of years. If this will happen anyway, why, why are we concerned about the kinds of cars that we drive, et cetera? That's, oh, thank you. Well, I think that's a, that's a very good question. Um, Closer to the mic, maybe. Move the mic around. You know, that's a really good question. And it, it all depends upon, you know, we are going to get some level of sea level rise. How's that? Okay, well, we're going to get some level of sea level rise. Um, we're in for that. But if we don't deal with the, the greenhouse gas um, uh, contributions that we're making, we're going to get a lot of sea level rise. And it may take several decades, it may take uh, several centuries, but we're going to get it. Um, the other part of it is the rate at which sea level rise happens. If we get gradual sea level rise like we've had for the last, you know, several thousand years, the, all the time frame that human civilization has built up, we, we can deal with that. But if we get very rapid sea level rise, we're going to get a lot of impacts in, in terms of people. 40% of the world's population live in coastal areas. That's, that's what, over 2 billion people. Now, if they all start um, to respond to sea level rise because they're being flooded, they're all going to move. A lot, of the act a lot of the problems we've seen in terms of climate change, the Arab Spring, for instance, occurred because of droughts in certain areas and a rise in food prices. Just little trip offense like that can lead to big social impacts. And if we start to ramp up those, uh, those uh, environmental impacts, we'll see a, a sort of multiplied effect across the globe in that kind of response. 
So really, it, it, it depends on everything we can do is really important in terms of reducing the amount of uh, impact that we're going to have the environment. So it really does come down to the individual. Thank you. And so Adrian Covert, if I could come to you next. Here's the question. You represent large tech companies. Who is negotiating with them to contribute a larger than parcel tax share, that being $12, for balance restoration? This contribution would significantly benefit the passage of Measure AA. Please talk with them. Thank you. That's sort of in the form of a question. <laughs> I'll take that as a comment. Uh, just kidding. So uh, the main thing that is really important to know about Silicon Valley and, uh, and sea level rise is that the main thing that's at risk aren't the company campuses even though they're by the bay. A lot of these campuses have got world-class flood protection infrastructure built in. Believe me, they're, they're protected. What's at risk is the shared public infrastructure that we all use, or that people who drive down 101, or who flush their toilets, wastewater treatment facilities, power stations. A lot of shared infrastructure is down right along the bay, particularly in the South Bay that we all share. Now that said, we can count um, uh, some very good conversations that we've been having to support this measure uh, with some major uh, tech companies who have, ag uh, who have agreed in private conversations with me that you know, they're doing this um, as, uh, to echo Tony Early, the CEO of PG&E, who's made so far the, the biggest contribution from the corporate world to this endeavor, because it's the right thing to do. It's a historic measure. All nine counties are being involved in it. Never before has anything like this happened at the regional level. And the fact that we're doing it to support the defining geographic feature of our region, the namesake of our region, the Bay Area after all is what we call it, uh, is really compelling to a lot of people uh, in a way that goes far beyond the dollars and cents um, or you know, mere corporate social responsibility. This is something that touches people a lot. And, and, uh, and we're going to be there, I think, with major support. And we already yeah, have some major support from Silicon Valley. Great. Thank you very much. And David Lewis, let me come to you next. How much money will Marin be allocated, and how will that be determined? And relatedly, what Marin sites besides Bell Marin Keys are on the priority list? So, uh, first of all, the measure, uh, the text of the measure that will be in your ballot will explain that um, half of the money that is raised will be uh, divided among uh, the four quadrants of the Bay, uh, and over the life of the expenditures over 20 years uh, will be spent in, uh, half of it will be spent in uh, proportionally that way, and then the rest of it will be spent uh, all around the Bay and there'll be projects in every county. Um, one of the things that's unusual about this measure as compared to maybe if you voted on a local bond measure for construction projects, um, and, and in that measure you might have the specific projects that are gonna be funded already laid out. And in this case, if the tax passes, we're creating a grant source. Uh, the Bay Restoration Authority doesn't own these projects, it doesn't own the land, and it actually doesn't control when these projects are going to be ready and, and eligible for grant funding. Um, each project will still need to meet all of the legal obligations, get all of its permits from BCDC and other agencies in order to be eligible. And in fact, most of the projects that have been done, like Hamilton Field, have had to cobble together money from multiple state and federal grant sources. And so now we'll have a local one. So uh, um, in addition to Belmarin Keys, uh, there are numerous smaller projects uh, uh, on the Marin County shoreline, and I mentioned that one because it's one of the largest and provide the most additional tidal marsh. Um, one last thing that I'll mention about this, the motivation of this tax is not primarily to increase property values. It's not primarily to increase property values. In some cases, where the tidal marsh is being created, and that's the main purpose of this measure, it will have a beneficial effect on infrastructure protection, and in some cases, some communities will get additional protection too. 
and that might protect some property values that otherwise would go down because of the increased flood risk. And so the polling that we've done, and one of the reasons the measure is constructed this way is because this is what people told us in polls they would prefer to have, it's, it's not constructed f so that dollar for dollar things go back to the county that they came from because people see the bay as a regional asset and they understand that improving tidal marsh in one part of the bay will improve the health of the overall bay. So that's the motivation people feel. That's the way the tax is constructed. Uh, and I will say that Marin County in this case is likely to get far more money back in tax dollars spent because you have these large re wetland restoration opportunities here than money that you as taxpayers in Marin will pay. Great, thank you. And Nancy Johnson, I have a question for you. You said Marin City is already experiencing flooding. What is the most important thing that needs to be done for Marin City residents? Thank you. I think one of the, well, the t at the top of my list is disaster preparedness. Uh, a plan for uh, the most vulnerable people in the community, and that would be, uh, you know, the people who need, who have mobility issues, uh, seniors, um, you know, mothers with young children, uh, just a plan on, you know, where to go, uh, you know, to have the uh, supplies available for, for people. We right now don't have a grocery store in Marin City, so, you know, what's going to happen if we are there for three, four, five days and not able to, uh, you know, have access to foods. So I think a, a disaster preparedness plan is uh, the most important thing for Marin City residents right now. And Dr. Crooks, if I can come back to you. Here's the question. Realistically, what green infrastructure can we advocate for here at a smaller, more local level? Does it exist, or is mega infrastructure projects our only hope? I don't know. <clears throat> Another good question. So, you know, it really comes at all kinds of different scales. You know, at, at the biggest scale, you know, the kind of things we've been thinking about is, um, you know, the reoperation of the, the reservoirs that provide water to California and how you open up the floodplain in the Central Valley, and you get benefits across that whole kind of scale. So these can be big, big projects, um, but they can also be small projects you know, greening of streets, uh, infiltration uh, pathways so that water can get into aquifers, or just off the, off the pavement area and soak into soils. Putting trees back in streets is, is, is very helpful. Restoring creek banks, you know, as they, as they go through, there's been a lot of work done in Berkeley and East Bay through some of the university campuses. You know, there's still many creek, uh, creeks that we can still restore in daylight. So even on the very small scale, you bring back a bit of the environmental benefits, and each little bit adds as well to some carbon sequestration. It's small stuff with small benefits, but they all do add up. It's not, we shouldn't just be reliant on sort of big, big projects. You know, if I can add to that, one of the things that we found in our report, um, which outlined the flood infrastructure damage of a major storm event, wasn't just from overtopping of the bay you know, and uh, flooding our coastal communities, our bayside communities, but a lot of that water comes from trickling down, running off from our cities. And the green infrastructure that Steve's talking about stops that water from reaching the bay and it gives it time to seep into our local groundwater basins, preventing that spillover effect. So a lot of communities are looking at green infrastructure, permeable pavements. This type of thing can really help. So this next, this next question is directed to David Lewis, but I think Dr. Crooks or Adrian Covert, if you want to weigh in as well, that would be great. So the question is, what percentage of the bayfront will be protected by restored wetlands? So the, uh, the opportunities to restore wetlands on about 30,000 acres around the bay, uh, as Adrian mentioned in his presentation, it doesn't provide the solution for sea level rise in all parts of the bay. Uh, the deeper areas and the areas where we've built up right to the shoreline where there's not a wetland restoration opportunity, uh, th this is not the solution for those areas. We'll need to look at, at other solutions. 
But I will say, uh, if you imagine back to the satellite image of the bay, um, most of the shoreline of San Francisco Bay south of the San Mateo Bridge and most of the shoreline of San Francisco Bay between Vallejo and San Rafael, which is a huge percentage of the shoreline, the, just those two areas alone. Um, the opportunity for wetland restoration and maintenance of existing wetlands and flood protection for infrastructure as a result of that, um, a lot of it is concentrated there. And there are other opportunities in the central bay between those two big expanses, but a lot of it is in the far north and far south. Great, so I have another, a number of questions about Measure AA, and so I'm gonna stick with these, this topic for a moment. Will funds from Measure AA be used for purchase of land, be used only for restoration of wetlands, flood protection, on public lands? They will not be used, not be used for purchase of land. We have a lot of areas already purchased waiting for restoration, um, and that's what this money will be for, for tidal marsh restoration um, that will provide other benefits where it's used. Um, yeah. and, and both public or private, privately owned land could be eligible for these funds if it's for a tidal marsh restoration project. Good example, one of the recent tidal marsh restoration projects completed in the far northern end of the bay near Sears Point Raceway. Uh, that property is owned by the Sonoma Land Trust, a conservancy. Uh, there are properties here in Marin that are owned by the Marin Audubon Society that could be eligible for these funds in addition to state and federal public lands that are reserved for this purpose. Adrian, did you want If I can add to that, the San Francisco... <laughs> the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority uh, actually put together a very thoughtful expenditure plan. You can read it online. And they outlined four buckets of programs that the money will be going to. And it's very clear. Wetland restoration, flood protection, pollution, uh, public access, and pollution runoff prevention. And so that's where it's going. Let me ask you one more, one more measure AA question for the moment, and then we're going to come back to that after a different topic. Here's the question. How will measure AA specifically address protecting current development from sea level rise? So measure, <coughs> measure AA will be spent on grants for tidal marsh restoration projects. And in some cases, those tidal marsh restoration projects can't be done without building levees at the back end to prevent flooding of adjacent areas. Some of those adjacent areas uh, would be communities of homes. A uh, good example would be in East Palo Alto or in Alviso. There are homes right next to these wetland restoration opportunities. Um, so those are examples of, of where it would provide some benefit. But there are plenty of areas around the bay where flood protection solutions are not available through wetland restoration. So recently in Foster City, uh, which is entirely at or below sea level, behind levees, those levees are not high enough for future sea level rise. So the residents of Foster City just voted to assess themselves uh, on their property taxes to pay for raising those levees. That cost is not being passed on to the rest of the Bay Area. And it's unfortunately not an opportunity for wetland restoration, uh, but it is an important flood protection measure they're taking. Great, thank you. I'm now gonna come up to a higher level question for you, Dr. Crooks. What happens to the Bay Area if both the polar ice caps melt 100%? Uh, <laughs> Run. Uh, well, we, we'll have a lot more area to sail around, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the area for sailing is going to be a lot, uh, a lot uh, deeper. Um, you know, that would be, a, well, it would take a long time to get to that stage. We are talking centuries, um, thousands of years most likely. Um, it would, everything would be different. Uh, the Sacramento Delta and the water supply there to Southern California, that would be completely saline, all those levees would fail. Um, our wetlands would move upslope. Um, the areas where people are living would now be subtidal. Um, deeply subtitle. <laughs> uh, we'd have wetlands higher up, we'd have trees, we'd all be concentrated in a lot deeper area, in a, a lot more of a fringe around the coastline. And, uh, but the whole world would be very different when we have that kind of sea level rise. It'd be quite an upheaval. 
So Dr. Crooks, I want to stick with you for a moment. So this card says uh, your bar graphs show different sea level rises for the same CO2 content in the atmosphere. How confident is the science on sea level rise as a function of atmospheric CO2 content? Well, you know, it, it's always been looked at in terms of the analysis and refining our understanding. Um, it is a very confident science now. You know, we, we've been looking at this for many decades. Um, the original theory about greenhouse gas uh, and how it affected um, climate change was first developed in 1850 by a guy, a guy called Tyndall. And um, it was actually a laboratory experiment, and it's been looked at many times since then. Um, the, you know, what, what it, uh, when we look in the past, it gives us a clue of what's going on in the future. Um, but it's not a perfect analogy because the world was different then. Um, part of what we're seeing when the different elevations of water, the different sea level back in the time, reflects the time it takes to get that amount of ice to melt. You know, 125,000 years ago, it was warm for a long period of time, a lot longer than it has been so far to date. And 40,000 years ago, uh, 400,000 years ago, it was warm for 40,000 years. All right, all, only we've had up to date is 10,000 years worth of warming. So for the same, uh, same amount of CO2, there was that gradual melting of ice which has taken place. We're actually due for about 50, 40 to 50,000 years of warming. Uh, right now, so we've got a very long warm period to come. So we will see that gradual ticking up of, of, of sea level. And we want it to happen slowly rather than quickly, but if we do melt a lot of ice because of the additional impacts of CO2 emissions, um, then we could see more ice melting than we did see over the last million years. And let me give you, I'm sorry, Adrian, please. Yeah, if I can add ahead. on one thing to that, uh, is that it, it was really important for us when we did the Bay Area Council, when we did the report on surviving the storm, to get out of the debate of whether or not sea level rise was true or not, which every reputable scientist in the world agrees that this is happening and that there's a, a human uh, component to this. Our study looks at the flood vulnerabilities right now, as it is today, without any sea level rise associated with it. What sea level rise will do is that with every inch of rise, we increase the impacts of the same storm that we modeled that much greater. Santa Clara Valley Water District actually said when we were doing interviews for our report that one of their largest wastewater treatment facilities would probably remain dry and functioning in the report that, in the storm that we modeled, but not in 2030. By 2030, our same storm would have flooded that just from another inch and a half or so of sea level rise. So it, it's, yeah, we're at currently at a, a significant vulnerability, and that's going to go up with every inch. Thank you very much. And, the, and one more question for Dr. Crooks that, Adrian, you may want to weigh in as well. Is there any way to reasonably estimate the difference in sea level rise that would result with A, continued greenhouse gas pollution globally versus B, making material improvements globally in reducing greenhouse gas pollution? I didn't quite I think it's pollution versus no pollution. Um, um, I can read it again for you, yeah, though. Please. Is there any way to reasonably estimate the difference in sea level rise that would result with A, continued greenhouse gas pollution globally, versus B, making material improvements globally in reducing greenhouse gas pollution? Yes, you know, these are, these are the basis of the various scenarios that come out of the IPCC reports. And they look at different amounts of economic development and what that's likely to mean in terms of um, the amount of greenhouse gases emitted and then how much sea level rise will we get and they look at other parameters. And then they also factor in how are people going to respond to this and you know, what kind of impact does it have on countries in terms of economic output, et cetera. And so the, the scenarios range from very high levels of sea level over a meter um, within 100 years um, to much lower numbers. Uh, and so these are the basis of the various scenarios and it's the basis that we all make our planning decisions upon. Now the question for us as a community is um, not so much how fast or how much sea level we're going to get in the next hundred years, um, but how risk averse do we have to be to manage this risk? Eventually we'll get these levels of sea level rise, but it really comes down to us and our risk assessments of how we want to manage our coastal systems. I think that's the important parameter. Great. Thank you, Dave. Just add something that I think was implied in what Steve said, but just to make it more explicit. The more action we take sooner, the more progress we make towards being on the right path. You know, 
if we uh, significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, over five years instead of over 20 years, uh, we get the benefit of that reduction every year. Um, and there's an analogous benefit to getting this wetland restoration accelerated and started in more places sooner. Because these tidal marshes can keep up with changes in the sea level rise if it doesn't happen too quickly. Sometimes people ask, well, why should we do this work if these marshes are eventually going to be drowned when the polar ice caps melt in 50 years or 100 years uh, when this melting happens faster? And there's two answers to that. One, we're, we're actually buying time for the bay and buying time for the endangered species by creating more habitat for them and getting these other benefits while we try to address greenhouse gas emissions and reduce the amount of sea level rise and other climate change that we're going to experience. So the other benefit is that if we, if we wait to get the tidal marsh restoration started until after sea levels have risen above where tidal marsh forms, it's much more difficult to get this restoration started and have it be successful. And just to add on to that, just this past October, the San Francisco Bay Estuary Institute updated their Baylands Goals Report. And the first Baylands Goals Report came out in 1999, and David highlighted it in his presentation. Uh, that was the first time the scientific community in the Bay came together and said, we need this 100,000 acre target to make a connected ecosystem Bay-wide. The update that came out in October, uh, this past October, highlighted that brought sea level rise into the equation and said we need to get a lot of this work started and on the move by 2030 because of sea level rise. And if we do it by 2030, these wetlands will be healthy enough to be able to naturally respond to sea level rise much more effectively and hold together the silts, et cetera, that they're gonna need to remain healthy. So uh, time is of the essence. Great, thank you. So a couple more Measure AA questions. Uh, here's one. The Bay and the economy are important, but are they so important that citizens should give up the basic principle of representative democracy? Should we vote for taxation without representation? Oh, uh, let, let me get to that. <laughs> and, then, and then David could get to it, too. First off, the Restoration Authority Board is made up entirely of elected representatives. And if you talk to any of them, and these are representatives representing the Bay Area, so each of their districts um, touch the bay in some way. And when you talk to them, and I've talked to the members of the Restoration Authority board, they'll tell you that on you know, their own campaigns, you know, they're asked about what they're going to do for the bay. So the bay is something that their constituencies elect them on, and they're elected representatives uh, as it is. And so I think that the way that this has been constructed is allows for democracy, it allows for accountability, and it allows for broad representation from all corners of the Bay. Okay, and another... David, another... did I get that right? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. All right, David? No. That's absolutely right. The, the only other thing I would add, um, you know, if you flip over your property tax bill, if you own property, and uh, look at all the different assessments that you're paying for school bond construction and for community colleges and lots of really beneficial things. Um, I have about uh, 20 or 25 on my tax bill and I think $2,000 more just paying for schools, which I'm happy to do. There's nothing as low as $12, <laughs> except for one thing. I pay $3.56 a year to the Contra Costa Mosquito and Vector Control District, which I'm also happy to do. I would, I would pay three or four times that if it would reduce uh, the mosquito bites again. But, uh, not only is this a tiny tax, which can do a lot of good because so many people are sharing in the cost, uh, but you will also not find any other tax that you're paying that will bring with it such a low overhead. I mean, the agency that is collecting this tax money has no staff. And it will be able to administer grants at a very, very low cost. So this tax money will go to actual implementation of projects uh, on the ground in, in a way that is very, very uh, high 
leverage. Great, thank you. We're gonna come back to a couple more questions on Measure A in a minute, but in the meantime, a couple different questions. Uh, Dr. Crooks, this is for you. We will need large amounts of sediment to create horizontal levees. Where will it come from? Um, some of it's naturally out there. You know, when we did Hamilton, you know, when there was this, uh, the Coastal Conservancy and the Corps of Engineers and uh, the City of Navarro built Hamilton, they brought, they brought in sediment as beneficial reuse from the deepening of the Port of Auckland. You know, seven million cubic yards. It's a substantial amount of sediment. Um, but it was reusing sediment that would have been dumped into the ocean. And so that was a very smart thing to do. Um, there is a lot of sediment in the bay. Now, the, the coasts of, of Marin County will respond differently to sea level rise, depending where you are. I live in Richardson Bay. There's not a great deal of sediment in that system. What there is comes down the rivers. So the wetlands there will struggle to keep up with sea level rise through time. Um, we're lucky that some were, were actually created with dredge material in the past. And they will, they will gradually go from up high marsh to low marsh, and may with high amounts of sea level rise drowned out unless we add sediment to them. Now, if you're in the Petaluma system or the Napa system or Sonoma, there's a lot of sediment and the, and the vegetation is very vigorous. Those systems are very resilient to sea level rise. Now, but if you're in the, in the middle between these two areas, you'll see a change. The, uh, the Bay of San Pablo Bay, well, you've probably noticed when you fl fly in, it's, it's round. You know, it's a very round system. That's because waves dominate. Those wetlands will build with sea level rise, but we'll see an erosion of the edge. There'll be a slow loss of, of wetlands. So we will see these changes with sea level rise um, through time. Our challenge is to plan to make sure that it's manageable. So that we have a, a, a range of habitats across the system that we can protect our coastal areas. And we're ready and we, we're, we're looking ahead so that we have an effective plan going forward for decades so that we can deal with this. Super, so Adrian Covert, there's a question for you. What are five or six of Marin County's commercial, residential, or transit areas most vulnerable to climate change, higher tides, flooding? Oof. I'd have to refer you to the appendix of the report uh, <laughs> for that level, granular level of detail. Um, uh, David, you might have actually a, a more well uh, <laughs> knowledge, not to put you on the spot, of well, the specific communities. If you leave we here, studied it focused really at the county level of the damages, yeah. so I'd have to refer back I'll to I'll give you two answers. If, if you leave here tonight, as I will, and drive back to the Richmond San Rafael Bridge, um, everything on both sides of Highway 580 will be extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. So that includes the Marin Municipal Water District uh, treatment plant. Um, it includes a number of important businesses and residential communities as well. Um, if, on the other hand, you drive north from here uh, into the Galenus Creek watershed before you get to Hamilton Field, uh, that Galenus Creek is also at sea level and it's tidal, and so Everything on both sides of that creek, um, Guinness Park, uh, the airport, uh, Autodesk, I believe, still has a facility there. These are all areas. Uh, this is the way Marin has developed, right? Marin has filled in the areas between the ridges along the bay and uh, put important development there. So these are, these are the areas that are most vulnerable, both private uh, homes and property and also shared public infrastructure. And the last thing I'll mention, when I used to come to Marin as a kid from the peninsula uh, to visit relatives, and my favorite thing was to drive past the houseboats in Sausalito <laughs> and the giant helicopter, the SFO helicopter <laughs> that uh, used to take off from there. Well, that road, as you know, is just a few feet above sea level, and there were some pictures earlier of uh, areas, not just Lucky Drive, but um, also closer to Marin City that flood on a frequent basis. So. This is all public infrastructure that many of us who don't live in Marin County uh, use as well as those of you who do live here. And if I could just add on to that answer for those of you who are interested in that particular question. Marin County through our Sea Smart program that looked at the impact of sea level rise on the coast of Marin County did a fantastic sea level rise vulnerability assessment that's available online at marinslr.org. We also currently are in the midst of our countywide Bay, Richardson Bay and Bay, San Francisco Bayside 
uh, joint county and city and town sea level rise vulnerability assessment. We're hoping that a draft of that study will become available probably June, July. But I encourage everyone to go to marinslr.org. There's a lot of information on there about areas that are vulnerable to sea level rise and the work that our flood control folks and others of us at the county have been doing to answer that and, and address those issues. And we're continuing to work on it, so stay tuned. Okay, back to a couple of questions on Measure AA. Um, what percentage of land eligible for wetland restoration is in Marin? I do not know the answer to that question. Um, but I, yeah, at least, there's at least uh, two or 3,000 acres in Marin County of the 30,000 acres that are already owned and reserved for that purpose. Okay. Um, you know, the, the map that you showed, David, map. is a really good approximation. Yeah. You can pull this map up from the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority website where they have potential projects that are mapped out. And it, it gives you a good visual approximation of what the realm of the possibility is. Great. And finally, this is the question we really all want to know the answer to. What likelihood is there that the next Bay Restoration Authority member from the North Bay will be from Marin? Hi. <laughs> uh, so the, those uh, Restoration Authority board seats are, are four-year terms. Um, there's a, one seat that is definitely reserved for the North a representative from the North Bay counties. It's uh, currently Keith Caldwell from Napa, uh, but he's nearing the end of his time as a supervisor. So um, interested elected officials mm. should mm -hmm. apply uh, <laughs> beginning of next year Fantastic. if they want to serve. All right, thank you for that. So I want, to, I want to thank our panel, and you've provided us with a great deal of really inf interesting information in, in your presentations and responding to questions, but I'm going to diverge from my instructions here for a minute and, and offer each of you the opportunity to make any closing remarks that you, want, you might want to make um, this evening, if anyone has anything to add. There's never been an opportunity like we have with Measure AA. I hope all of you will not only vote for it, but help us to pass it. Uh, if you want to learn more about how you can do that, there's uh, information at the table in the back on this on this side, and, and thank you all for helping us. Nancy, you want to add? <laughs> I just, um, first of all, I just really want to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to sit here with these people. <laughs> they are, they're fantastic. <laughs> And then I just want to say, um, if you um, need to update your uh, voters' uh, information, there's an opportunity for you to complete a voter's registration form, or if you are a new voter, you have an opportunity to co complete the forms that are at the back to make sure that you can cast your vote for Measure Double. No. Measure AA. <laughs> so thank you all so much for being here in your warm reception. Thank you. I think I'd leave you with this. There are very few opportunities that we're ever going to have to tackle flood protection, environmental improvement, improving our lifestyle by public access to, the inner, to, uh, to our uh, environment. Uh, and do so at a regional level in a way that's never been done before. So I can't think of any other example of any kind of initiative that would provide so many benefits. And I know that the presentation that I did at least had a lot of statistics and big numbers, but to bring it back to some of the things that Nancy was saying, this could impact our lives in a really real tangible way, including protecting schools, our hospitals, the places that we use to take care of our friends and loved ones, and even things that may seem not important but really are, like Nancy, you actually mentioned supermarkets. And supermarkets are, the, the Safeways are one of the most uh, vulnerable chains of businesses in the 100-year floodplain. And these are places that not only provide you know, working class, middle class jobs, but also food, you know, for people to actually eat in distribution centers 
in natural disasters. So again, I leave you with that this is a great win-win-win for flooding, for the environment, for protecting our communities, and improving our overall quality of life, and it's at a really, really low cost. So remember that it's going to AA for the bay, down the ballot, stick it through on election day. <laughs> After you vote for everyone, it's down there. Right, thank you. you know, we, we can tackle the challenges with climate change. I think countries are going to step forward. It's coming down to the community level. And um, you know, we can do this. And I think measures like AA are going to be very important because we have to do them now. We have to also begin our planning now for how to adapt to climate change so that we're set for not just decades but centuries to come. Now, measures like AA really help set that scene and they start restoring wetlands and they start bringing back those environmental benefits. And so I think this is a great opportunity to really step up now while we can and it'll really set us in a good stead about the future moving forward. Great, thank you so much. So, so I wanna just um, wrap up here by really thanking our panelists for an incredibly interesting evening. And, and I wa also wanna thank uh, a Time to Lead on Climate Coalition and all of our volunteers. I understand that we have 20 volunteers from high schools throughout Marin who helped put on this program. And I think, uh, you know, as we all know, there's really nothing more important than engaging our young people in getting involved in tackling the challenge of climate change. So, so I think we've heard a lot of things that inspire us all to get even more involved than we may be today. And I hope that everyone will go to the website leadonclimate.org and think about what are the group, which groups listed on that website are you most interested in and you would like to join with them and help make a difference. Um, I really want to also thank everyone in this audience for being here. It takes all of us being engaged, working together, sharing ideas to address sea level rise, but also all of the other climate change impacts that we have not yet talked about this evening. Wildfire, drought, extreme weather events of various sorts. And these are all topics that I hope that this and other organizations in Marin County will move the conversation forward to. So we really are looking at climate change and the impacts and what we need to do to reduce our use of fossil fuels, to reduce our threats from all these different, uh, uh, different kinds of outcomes that are our future. Um, particularly if both of those polar ice sheets melt and we need to get our boats out. But, but I know this, everyone here is very engaged. I encourage you to stay engaged. Uh, and keep the good thoughts coming and help us keep moving forward on mitigation and adaptation. And I see a hand up in the front row. All right, so did everyone hear that? This is a very important point to vote on measure AA and I'd say a few other things as well. Um, <laughs> you have to be registered to vote by May. 23rd. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. And good night. Thanks for being here. <laughs>